the silly dilly Oops, approach yeah, that we are taking tonight is um, partly irreverent and partly inappropriate for which we do not apologize at all. We <laughs> decided this year that since we have Cantor Schroen leading us in a traditional Slichot service at 10, that we can do something that approaches human failings with humor. And the season we are starting tonight in the Slichot service at 10 o'clock is the season of the Yamim no Ra'im, the days of awe, the days of Teshuvah or upon us when we have to do our soul searching and we have to really, you know, face the man in the mirror, as it were, and our own failings. And we have to do the hard work of trying to repair mistakes we've made. And so uh, one of the ways that we can, uh, you know, a, achieve forgiveness with other people is actually through humor. If someone comes to you with a sincere desire to repent and they're terribly uncomfortable and you wish to forgive them, one of the best ways to do it is to kind of joke around with them a little bit about it. It's really serious and I appreciate it. It means the world to me, but you should rest your heart at ease because I understand mistakes. I've made mistakes. And if you're able to see foibles instead of insults, it's going to go a long way to repairing the world and creating the kind of community that we all want to have anyways. So today we enter the town of Helm and uh, we had uh, a, a very, very competitive casting process for this evening. Um, anybody who could string two intelligent sentences together was not allowed in the show. We needed people who could contradict themselves and not knowing they were contradicting themselves who could see things that were absurd and think that they were real. This yeah. is the nature of the wise person of Helm. Um, this is a well-documented part of Jewish folklore coming out of Europe. There's a whole literature of the wise people of Helm and I hope that you will Google it and you will read it and you will enjoy it. Um, I do want to thank, um, actually I'll ask Anne. Anne, could you please thank those who put the hard work in in the background to make tonight a reality? Well, James really took control of making sure we had a really good script. He, he worked with something that was a little very kind of difficult and too long, which is not good at all. So he adapted and adjusted and tweaked it. And I did a great job. If only I could see him, there he is. Um, Al was a natural rabbi. <laughs> He'll be covering for me on second day Rosh Hashanah this year. <laughs> Which way will you? Michael, uh, you'll see everyone. They Each one is bringing just the right Yiddish and Tom to his and her job. Okay, very good. And thank and you, Anne, play Seth. for the spirit behind it. So, Seth, if you could give me a little musical prelude, and then I will go into the first character. Uh, we empty the stage. If the cast could please go invisible for a moment. Uh, as the pit orchestra sets the proper tones. Welcome to a Zoom reading of a Jewish fractured folklore fairy tale. Now, you will soon hear about Chelm from our beloved storytellers. But first, let me tell you a little bit about their little shtetl. Chelm is a world famous place. Famous for its prudence? No. Uh, perhaps famous for its judgment? Mm, no, also not, no. <laughs> ah, for their wisdom, the wise people of Chelm? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide by the end of the play. But they do ask a lot of questions in Chelm which we all know in Judaism is a very good thing. As the great piece of sacred literature Yentl once said, we judge a student by their questions, not by their answers. So the rabbi in Chelm one day said, please tell me learned Talmidim, my scholars, which is more important, the sun or the moon? One of the Talmidei Chachamim, the brilliant scholars said, the moon is more important than the sun, without a doubt. And the rabbi said, why is that? And the brilliant student said, because the moon shines at night when it's needed. 
the sun shines only during the day when there's plenty of light. You don't need the sun during the day. It's bright out. So, you see the logic of Helm? It makes a Helmish sort of sense. So let's begin the show, and I wish you to enjoy and have nachas from the wise people of Helm. Maestro. Hello, B'nai Shalom Zoomers. Shalom Aleichem. Tonight, we present a Zoom play of a folk tale, hundreds of years old. So, do you know any new folk tales? Well, anyway, we will hear about what these Helm people said, did, and didn't do. Frequently foolish, but sometimes, sometimes, Ever so well. So, my Venetian lovers, let's go. Listen, audience, as we begin, this is important stuff for you to know. This is known as the setup. So, please pay attention. Here goes. So, first, God created the earth. Second, God wanted to fill the earth with people. Third, after all this tiring creating business, God wanted to rest up a bit, watch some past episodes of Stissel, drink some diet cream soda, sit back, chill. Very understandable, no? <sighs> God simply decided to outsource the project of filling the earth with people. God picked two angels for the job. God gave each one a sack, one small sack filled with wise souls, and one enormous sack filled with foolish souls. The idea was to sprinkle the wise and foolish souls all over the earth. The first angel was known to be careful and meticulous. God gave this angel the small sack filled with wise souls. Now, God did not know much about the second angel. But like I said, God was tired and thought, what could go wrong? Besides, I have two episodes of Schnitzel to catch up on. Well, for this angel, the second one, God should have asked for references. As it happened, the second angel carrying the enormous sack of foolish souls tripped over a mountain peak and the entire sack of fools spilled out. Schlemiels, bunglers, schlemazels, take your pick. They all fell, tumbled and twirled and landed in one spot, one tiny little shtetl. One ridiculous speck of a town made up entirely of foolish, wise people. How? Okay, B'nai Shalom Zoomers, so much for the setup. Let me introduce our first three characters. Character number one, Muttel. The mayor is a pious man, but practical in a Helmish sort of way. Next, character number two, Pinchas. Pinchas is the Rebbe, the teacher, an intellectual, not so practical. Well, truth be told, not at all practical. And now, character number three, Gimple. <gasps> what can I tell you about Gimple? He is young yet. Hopefully, a wise man in training. Okay, audience, please pay attention. You must imagine that Gimple has just fallen from the roof of his little home with a loud thump. And an even louder... Ouch! Young Gimple is laying on the ground motionless, upset, alarmed, 
Muscle and pancreas run over the gimple. Gimple, gimple. What did I tell you? Did I not warn you not to climb up on that roof? Did I not tell you that you would fall off and get yourself killed? Enough already, Rapinchas. I'm not moving. I'm dead. What do you mean you're dead? What do I mean I'm dead? I mean I'm dead. Kimpo, what are you talking about? How can you be dead? Did you not say I would fall down and get killed? I did. I warned you. And are you not an honest man? I am. He is. He is an honest man. Aha! Uh -huh. And did I not climb up on the roof in spite of your warning, Red Pinchas? Yes, yes. You climbed up and you fell down, just like I said you would. Then I must have been killed, so I'm dead. I see. So the matter is settled. But he's talking, Red Pinchas. True, true, Reb Moto. But this is not proof that he is not dead. We need proof that he is not dead, or we must bury him. You would bury him? The dead must be buried. It is written. But he's alive. Not according to him. Mm -mm. Gimple, Gimple, do you have pain? How can I have pain? I'm dead. There, you have it. He feels no pain. He must be dead. Kimbo, Kimbo, do you feel anything at all? Well, to be perfectly honest, Ramatl. Yes, yes. I feel hungry. <laughs> hungry? No, no, uh, I'm not hungry. Uh, I just had a bowl of borscht. Not you, Red Pinchas. Gimple. Gimple had a bowl of borscht? What? When? He's dead. Period. He's dead. Red Pinchas, I ask you, do the dead feel hunger? No, it's not possible. It is not written. Then there's your proof. Gimple is not dead. I'm not dead? You're alive and hungry. Oh, well, a nash would be welcome. So come, some borscht, a little bread, a little herring, it couldn't hide. So, the matter is settled. Now, dear audience, you must understand that these three men, and in fact, all the people of Chelm did not know that they were, to put it as kindly as possible, frequently foolish. The people of Chelm simply accepted that for some peculiar reason, foolish things were always happening. They found themselves befuddled right in the middle of a muddle. But as you will find out, they were occasionally wise, surprisingly very wise. Ah, but look Zoomers, here comes a man not from Chelm, a stranger, a stranger with a skinny cow. A very skinny cow. There, there, Yenta. I don't want to sell you, but I am a poor man and I don't know what else to do. You and this one gold coin, one gold coin, are all that I have left in this world. Apart, we may still starve but at least we will not starve so soon. Ooh. Now, young Gimple shows up and is greeted by the stranger. Oh, Shalom Aleichem, stranger. Uh, peace be with you, and also with your cow. And with you, kind sir, Aleichem Shalom. With whom do I have the pleasure of exchanging greetings? My name is Gimple, and I am off to see the world. Now, Zoomers, as you know, the stranger has only one gold coin and only one skinny cow. So the stranger begins to circle Gimple, eyeing him for items of value worth bartering for. Young Gimple is totally unaware that the stranger is sizing him up. Uh, 
Um, he just connected himself. So young Gimple is unaware that the stranger is sizing him up. <laughs> we lost Jim. We have a little problem in Helm. A little technical difficulty. <laughs> and a Helmish sort of problem. So let's do uh, Let's the cell service in Helm is not very good today. <laughs> Helm has its little troubles. I, Jim. Maybe I it. should read Jim's I'll part. Yes, yes. Right on. So, Jim, okay, I'm going to read Jim's part. Perfect. Okay, hang on. I just have to do one little oh, thing so that everybody looks oh, like Wait, there he is. So, Gimple. Moo! Gimple is Moo! <laughs> <laughs> So no, Gimple. Too. Oh, oh, oh. oh, Jim. You got me? Yeah, so Gimple, gotcha. off to see the world. Okay. So Gimple, off to see the world, are you? And how much of it have you seen so far? Well, only the shtetl of my birth, and also the shtetl of my childhood, and also the shtetl of my youth. All those places? All? Oh, no, no, only one. Helm. I've never left it. Well, until today. Helm. Is that where we are? Oh, just outside. It's over there, over the next hill. Uh, it seems to me I've heard of hell. No doubt. Its reputation travels before me wherever I go. So why is Helm so well known? Because everyone in Helm is wise. Everyone? Everyone. <laughs> All wise men? All wise men. And wise women? Of course, wise women. Even wiser than the men. Wise children, too. Certainly wise children. Also wise dogs, wise cats, wise chickens, wise roosters. And <coughs> even wise cows. <laughs> moo, moo. A town wise to the last living creature and not a single fool among them? Yes. Not a single fool? Not possible. I'm thinking to myself, this helm is where I'm. <gasps> where I must go. He's frozen. Uh oh, there I must go to sell my yenta. <laughs> oh, well, stranger, all this walking and talking, I think I must lay down, take off my boots, and rest my eyes. But just so I know which way I should be going when I awake, I will point my boots away from Helm and point them in the direction of the big wide world where I'm heading. Now, the stranger looks closely at the sleeping Gimple's coat, Gimple's boots, anything that might be of value. He holds up the boots and sees that they are too small for him. And even though the stranger is a man who travels around with a cow, the stranger finds the boots far too smelly even for him uh, to borrow permanently. Yeah. But standing there holding Gimple's boots while Gimple sleeps, the stranger begins to feel a sneeze coming on. Uh, uh. A big sneeze. Uh. A very big sneeze. Uh. Well, you can guess the rest. Gesundheit. <laughs> Frightened at being found out, the stranger immediately drops Gimple's boots to the ground. Bump. And this is a very, very important plot point, Zoomers. The stranger carelessly drops the boots facing in the opposite direction. As you remember, before young Gimple fell asleep, Gimple made sure his funky smelling boots were facing in the direction of the big wide world. Instead, Gimple's boots were now pointing back to the shtetl of Gimple's birth, childhood, and youth. That is to say, Helm. Oy. The stranger, now worn out from achieving absolutely nothing, decides he also needs to rest his eyes and lays down next to his dear cow, Yenta. But, and dear audience, this is another important plot point the careless stranger, not realizing it, drops his one gold coin on the ground where it rolls under Yenta. 
The tired stranger falls into a deep sleep and snores. The stranger snoring wakes Gimple up. Gimple puts on his funky smelling boots. Hey, I must be on my way. Shalom Aleichem, stranger, and your cow. I must now follow the way my boots point me. Goodbye, Helm. I am off to the big wide world. As Kimple moves on, Muddle and Pinchas arrive. I'm telling you, Pinchas, it's amazing. With this new steam locomotive they're talking about, you can leave Helm in the afternoon and be in Warsaw the next day by two o'clock in the morning. I don't get it, Red Moto. Why would I want to arrive in Warsaw at two o'clock in the morning? An excellent question, Red Pinchas. Who knows? I had not thought of such a difficulty. I would much prefer getting off at the Lublin train station. Why? It's much closer and I could get to bed much sooner. Truly, I am amazed at your wisdom. At this point, Muddle and Pichas notice the stranger and the cow. Who's this Pinchas? Give a look at what we have here. I have never seen such a skinny cow in my whole life. And what's this underneath the cow? What is under the cow? Yes, Randy. Picks up what is underneath this coin. cow? It looks like a gold coin. It is a gold coin, no doubt about it. Where could it have come from? We are not wealthy people. No one here has gold to toss around on the ground. So what are you saying? The gold coin fell from the sky? No, that couldn't be. Uh, look up, Marco. The sky is way up there, too far away. A tree then. A tree then. You think the gold coin grew on a tree? Well, there is an old saying and it's on the tip of my tongue about trees and money growing, something like that. Or maybe it's herring and shrubs. It eludes me, it eludes me at the moment. But no, it's not possible. There are no trees hereabouts. The trees are far over there. But the golden coin was right here, where there are no trees, not even shrubs, certainly no herring. Hmm, after prudent reflection, it's as clear as a bell, a cowbell. Not even shrubs, no, nope, no. Nope. Sorry, uh, it was, the golden coin came from the cow. Now, Pinchas is an honest man. He carefully puts the gold coin back under the end of the cow. You think the cow gives golden coins? What other reason would a man keep such a skinny cow? Well, then. Aha. Stranger, stranger. Wake up, wake up. Rise and shine. Stranger, we want to buy your cow. You must be asleep. Stranger, stranger, we want to buy your cow. I must be dreaming. You want to buy my cow, my Yenta? Move, move. I will give you my best winter coat for her. Your best winter coat for this cow? All right, all right, it's not much, I admit. Okay, Mortal's best winter coat plus my pocket watch. It was my father's watch. My Zaid is before him. It's a heirloom. Three generations. An heirloom, you say? Still. <laughs> Still not enough? Leave this in my hands, Reptons. This matters of the marketplace are not for a man of higher learning like yourself. Stranger, I see you are insulted by our meager offer. This is understandable. Come with us to our homes, and we will trade you all that we have of value for your remarkable cow. Excuse me, gentlemen, but with the greatest respect, 
permit me to ask you, have you maybe lost your minds? Still not enough. Mortal, we must go back to the stable. We must ask our neighbors to help us. With a cow like this, for the rest of our days, we'll want for nothing. It's only proper that we share this golden opportunity with everyone. You are absolutely right, Red Pinterest. You are a wise man. Stranger, wait here for us, please. We'll get you everything you want for that cow. Let's go over there. Stranger, where are you? Lost him again. The voice of the I'm substitute stranger. Okay. I'm fully awake. I got not it. Dreaming. They call me stranger, and that is true. I am a stranger here. What is the saying on the tip of my tongue? I'm a stranger in a strange band. A stranger in a strange brand. Ah, oh, no. It'll lose me for the moment. What else will lose me is that gold coin next to my calienta. Gentlemen, we are bargaining only for my calienta. We're not bargaining over the gold coin. Please hand it over to me. Oh, please. Here, here. Take back that one gold coin. But please wait for us here. We will be back very soon. I'll wait. I'll wait. Where would I go? A saying flits through my mind. A fool and his what? Honey, bunny, are soon parted. Somehow I know the saying applies to these Chalmites and their strange ways of thinking. It can be a sign, Yanta, huh? A sign that our luck is about to improve. Some time passes. Here we are, here we are, we are back, stranger, with these two sacks. Just as Rapinz was predicted, our neighbors were extremely interested in this deal. We have gathered the entire town's valuables, and we are now offering them to you in exchange for your cow. So, so this is your final offer? Yes, this is it. These sacks contain everything of value that our shadow possesses. Done. Done? It's a bargain? The cow is ours? No! Don't worry, Yentela. These people will take good care of you. Look how nicely they have treated me. Oh, yes. The best of care. Nothing but the best. Thank you, stranger. We can never express our gratitude. Nor I. My blessings upon you, upon you and your children for a thousand generations. <laughs> Farewell. Moo! Such a deal. Such a deal. So now we come upon Gimple. As you remember, he believes he has walked to Warsaw. The great big world. But this is what else? A fool's errand. Unbeknownst to him, he has gone in the completely opposite direction. Gimpo believes he's in Warsaw, but is actually still in hell. It's a miracle. I, I tell you, who would have thought it's possible? Warsaw looks exactly like my own village of Helm. Every pebble, every tree, every house, every gate. Why, even that rabbi looks exactly like Red Pinchas. And the man next to him, like the mayor of Helm, Mayor Muttel. I am amazed. I am stunned. I, I am flabbergasted. Gimbo, back from seeing the world already. Back already? What are you talking back already? I'm talking back already because you're back already. Back where? Where? Where in Helm is there? Don't be ridiculous. This is not Helm, this is Wasser. How can this be Wasser? This is not even Lupin. I am here, am I not? Yes, you're here. Why shouldn't you be here? Who are you? 
Who am I? I am Mutzel the mayor. Who else would I be? No. You are the mayor here, and your name is Mutzel. You don't recognize me. I'm Mutzel, I tell you. I, I believe you. It's just that in my village of Helm, we too have a Mutzel the mayor. And he looks exactly like you. Gimpo, what is this nonsense? Have you taken a leave of your senses? Gimpo, Gimpo, you call me. How is it you know my name? Why should I not know your name? Have I not known you since the day you were born? Uh, that's not possible. You must be having me confused with another Gimple. If there's a Muddle in Helm who looks like you, no doubt there's a Gimple in Warsaw who looks like me. In every town in the world, perhaps, there's a Muddle and a Gimple and a Gimple and a Muddle. I guarantee you there is not another Gimple who looks like you in Vasa, not even in Lublin. That's not possible. You must have me confused with another, no? Then probably that Gimple is off seeing the world. That Gimple could be in Helm right now, even as we speak. I tell you, we agree. Gimple is in Helm right now as we speak. I may, I may. Well, audience, here comes Pinchas with him as Yentl the cow, looking ashamed. Moo! 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 Red Muzzle, look! It's the stranger's cow! You know this cow? Well, I know a cow that looks like this one. Oh, no, 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 Kim. I am proud to say two cows like this one in Helm can never be. Not even in Lublin, Warsaw, or even far away on Pleasant Valley Way. I don't know about the rest of the world, Reb Motel. I am not filled with pride, but I am full of regret. I can say with certainty that there is no other cow like this in Helm. What are you talking about, Red Pinchas? Why have you suddenly brought us this cow? It doesn't work. What doesn't work? The cow. She doesn't give gold. You tried? Every person in the village, not in their grave, tried. She doesn't even give milk. Oy vey. Oy vey. How can I put it? How can I put it? Okay, Zoomers, here it comes. She is an utter failure. Oh, I'm so sorry, dear oh. Zoomers. But Red Pinchas, we saw the gold coin right under her. With our own eyes, we saw. We saw, we saw, and now we don't see. No, nothing. No gold, no milk, nothing. What did I tell you? It doesn't work. We must find the stranger and return the cow. We must get back our valuables. Why should the stranger give back two sacks of treasure for a cow that gives no gold? You're right, Reb Motto. Well, of course I'm right. A deal is a deal. Except you're wrong. What do you, why, why do you think I'm wrong? The cow gives no gold to us. That doesn't mean she wouldn't give gold to the stranger. A fine point, Lepimpus, a very fine point. So why wouldn't the stranger give back our valuables? Rich enough he'll be either way. It'll make no difference to him. You are a wise man, Lepimpus, but there is one thing you have not considered. And what is that? The stranger could be anywhere by now. We must look for him and get back our valuables. Who has time? Yeah, who has time? Who has time to search the world for him? Gimple! Yes, Motto. Yes, Motto. Gimple. Gimple, my young friend. You recognize this cow. Would you recognize the stranger who sold her to us? Well, it might not be the same stranger, only one who looks like him. Good enough. You, Gimbo, are the world traveler among us. 
take the cow with you. When your, mouth cross, when your path crosses with that stranger again, give the cow back and get us our valuables. This is a big job you're asking, Rabbi. <laughs> Please, Gimbo, it's a mitzvah, a blessing, a kindness. All right, then, it's a mitzvah. We'll go search for him. Come on, Yenta. We'll try to get the stranger to take you back. Moo! Moo! In time. Gimple and Yenta the cow come upon the stranger. Ooh, Yenta, my poor skinny Yenta, you've missed me, haven't you? It's so good to see you, Purim. I've missed you too. Shalom alaykum, stranger. Alaykum shalom. You are the stranger who sold Yenta to Muslim at Pinchas. Yes, I admit it. Well, I am here to tell you the cow doesn't work. Doesn't work? Yenta doesn't give gold. Doesn't even give milk. Doesn't work. Yenta will certainly give milk if she eats enough hay. In the winter, she always has. But this winter, I had no money. No money, no hay. No hay, no milk. That's why Yenta is such a skinny cow. Well, as far as it goes, that makes sense. But it doesn't go far enough. Why doesn't Yenta give gold? No, 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 you've gone too far. Why should Yenta give you gold? Exactly. Clearly, the gold Yenta gives is meant only for you. Young man, let me ask you a question. Yes, stranger. Why should Yenta give gold to me? I'll tell you. I don't know why she should give gold to you. But that was a gold coin under her, yes? Yes. And she was your cow? Yes. Well, then the matter is obvious. So obvious it goes without saying. The matter is settled. What is settled? The matter is settled. You can take Yenta back and return their valuables. What difference does it make to you? Whether you have their valuables or whether you have Yenta's gold, either way, you're a rich man. To Reb Muddle and Reb Pinchas and their neighbors, However, it makes a big difference. So, I bring you your beloved Yentala, and I ask you, please, to return the price that was paid for her. This is impossible. This is, this is, this is very strange. I, I'm a stranger? Yes, I'm a stranger here. It's, it's a saying. I am a stranger in a strange band. No, that's not it. I'm a stranger in a strange brand. No, that's not it either. It eludes me for the moment. But their treasure has bought me a house, a seat in the synagogue by the eastern wall. I cannot get these things up. There must be another way. But what? So, stranger, what do you say? I must stall for time. What? do I say? What can I say? What can I say? It's true that valuables were exchanged for my enter. So huge a treasure I had to hire two men to carry it. Two men carried it? Yes, of course. I paid them myself. I could never have traveled this far carrying those two huge sacks by myself. Then that presents a problem for me. For you? How does this present a problem for you? How can I carry such a load? One man traveling a distance alone. I begin to see a ray of hope. Yeah, that is a problem, isn't it? Yes, young man. Yes, that certainly is a problem. Yes, it is a problem. A very heavy problem. Ah, but wait, wait. I have a sudden inspiration. Instead of the original valuables, which are so heavy and impossible for one man to carry, especially such a distance. No, I will do you a favor. I will give you an equal amount of something lighter. Something lighter? Feathers. Feathers. What could be lighter than feathers? Feathers? Yes, feathers to fluff your pillows, feathers to stuff your comforters, feathers to warm like an oven the linings of your winter coats. Who needs a necklace here or a pocket watch there? When the winter wind blows hard down your neck and up your sleeves, what could be better or lighter to carry? Then feathers. Feathers! Nothing could be better. Feathers it is. Done. Wait here, my friend, and I will bring you your new treasure. What a stroke of good fortune. Feathers! Moo! After a while, 
A stranger returns with two sacks of feathers. Here are your feathers, young man. And here is your yenta. Shalom alaikum, my friend. Alaikum shalom, stranger. Peace be with you, and also with your yenta. Such a deal. Such a deal. Gimpo has begun his long trek home. Without having gone too far, he finds he has a problem. Whoever said something was light as a feather never had to carry two large sacks of feathers. Uh, it's such a windy day. One feather is nothing. One large sack is just manageable, but two sacks is just too much. I have such a wind. But wait, why should a man schlep when the wind has nothing better to do? The wind is blowing my way. I'll empty the sacks and let the strong wind carry the feathers for me. Fly away, feathers. Fly away home. Time passes as Gimple has almost finished his trek back to Helm, where Mottle and Pincus wait for him. Uh, Red Mottle, Red Pincus. Gimple, you're back. You found a stranger. You returned the cow? I found the stranger and I returned the cow. So? So? So there are valuables. Still with the stranger. Impossible. You found the stranger. You gave him the cow. What have you done with our valuables? Nothing. I never saw your valuables. I never touched your valuables. The stranger explained to me that your valuables were given to him in two very large, heavy sacks. Two men it took to carry those sacks, did it not? Red Pincus and I carried them to him, yes, yes. And how did you expect one man to carry them back? Well, you know, I never gave that much thought. Aha, but the stranger and I did. Instead of two heavy sacks, he gave me two not so heavy sacks. With these two sacks the stranger gave you, but not so heavy, what was in them? Feathers, Red Pinchus. Feathers? Feathers for your pillows, feathers for your comforters, feathers for the linings of your coats, comforters for the cold north wind that will be blowing our way, carrying winter in its icy teeth. Ah, feathers, yes. That's very good, very nice. But where are the feathers? Also being carried by the wind. Two sacks of feathers are not so light and airy as you might suppose, Red Pinchus, but the wind can carry them with ease. So I gave them to the wind. All you have to do now is wait for the wind to blow them in, and in no time you'll gather them up. I have here two sacks for the job. All right. We'll wait. A day or two, we'll wait. Or three or four, we'll wait. For seven days and seven nights, we'll wait. We'll wait, we'll wait. Seven days pass, and it starts to rain. <laughs> ah, it's starting to rain on us. Please be so kind as to open your umbrella. No. Why not? It's raining on us. Open your umbrella. There's no point. Well, I mean, no point in opening your umbrellas. We're getting soaked by the rain. <laughs> I tell you, Marco. There is no reason to open up, open it up. My umbrella is filled with holes. It's like a sieve. Th then why did you bring such an umbrella? I didn't think it was going to rain. Ah. Well, there certainly can be no arguing with your reasoning. The rain stops and the sun comes out. Gimple arrives. Gimple? Yes, Red Muggle. I have a question for you. The wind has blown for seven days, almost without a stop. Suppose we never see these feathers. Suppose the wind has scattered them all over the world. It's possible, you know. Yes, it's, uh, it's possible. And if it ha happens, what then? This is something we have to consider very carefully. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Once again, for seven days and seven nights, the wise people of Helm pondered this imponderable question. At last, drawing on ancient wisdom as it is written, Reb Pincus decided that the scattering of the feathers was a sign. A sign, Reb Pincus? Yes, yes, a sign. A sign of what, Reb Pincus? This, we don't know yet. Uh, Reb Pincus. Yes, Gimple? This sign, Reb Pincus. Uh, feathers in the wind. Perhaps it tells us that we too must be scattered. We too must go out, out into the world. What do you think, Reb Pincus? Could this be a sign? It is possible. It is written. Uh, Reb Muttle, Reb Pincus, I have often thought about this. Our fortune is out there with our feathers. We have waited for cows to give gold and for the men to return our feathers. So no? Enough waiting already. Tell everyone we must go. To the world. To feathers. To life. To life. <laughs> to life. <laughs> And so it comes to pass that the foolish souls of Helm left their tiny shtetl and were scattered throughout the world as it was intended in the beginning. If in your own wanderings or even in your own room, in your own town, you happen upon a foolish person, perhaps that person is a descendant of the people of Helm. Oh, and take a moment. Please consider this. If you ever find yourself acting foolishly, perhaps you are one from Helm as well. After all, it is possible. Bravo! Bravo! <laughs> we will be unmuting. Everyone can unmute if they wish. I have a. I have some closing remarks, Rabbi. Substitute. Go ahead. Stranger. Well, now you've just seen the production. Now let me let me introduce the players who brought Helm to life. The show was introduced by our own Rabbi Tobin. Yay! Yay! That's right. Who was our first storyteller and Zoom master? Thank you, Rabbi. Now we have our other stellar storytellers, and Spring. Hey. Harry Kirschenbaum. Hey. Hey. Lovely couple of Jerry and Carol Gullag. Thank you. Hey. Thanks for the hat, Carol. Our video. <laughs> A little small, but it's, it's brilliant. Al Spring is Pincus. Hey. Hey. Great hat with the with the payas on the hat. Uh, <laughs> Pink is the wise rabbi of come. Jeff Kirschenbaum is model, the most practical Yay! man in the world. Uh, Jeff, looking good over there. Bernie, Bernie Riga, the young Gimple, perhaps the future wisest man of come, wherever the wind takes him. Bernie! Uh, Bernie got celebratory powers. <laughs> wow, and last but not least, our own. James Hardwood, the Enter the Cow and the Stranger. But thank you, thank you, James, again, for uh, rewriting the script, and all that you did, and all your humor and creativity. Much appreciated. Welcome, thank you. Welcome to TV, live TV, 1940. And, and, and one more person, Seth Salzman, Benesha, yes. who many of you heard at, at numerous synagogue events, who tied everything together with his perfectly selected music. And we gave him a little trouble now and then. <laughs> we also want to thank Gary Rothschild for helping us with all of this, our technical, hey. logistics, hey. and his time. 
We want to thank Leslie Gleaner for her casting yes. help and suggestions. Yes. And of course, we are pleased to thank what? Ronnie Horn, the director of our Culture and Learning Center, who came up with the idea of presenting a play reading this year. Thanks. Yes.